Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, first uh, Tigre NGN uh, UK Italy uh, joint webinar. Uh, I'm Andrea Mazza, I will going to share, share this uh, session. Uh, I'm a member of uh, NGN Italy. Uh, so first of all, uh, to be compliant with the GDPR, I'm going to say that this webinar will be recorded. So if you, if you disagree about, uh, uh, let's say, this uh, point, please uh, leave the, the webinar because uh, we are doing to make it. Um, so uh, the, the, the webinar will be organized like this. Now there is, will be the short presentation about the SIGRE, NGN, uh, Italy and the UK. Then we pass the word to the two speakers, Dr. Uh, uh, Martinez Cesena and Dr. Calcara. Uh, I will present them uh, briefly them later on, but first of all, I'm going to uh, provide the, uh, let's say, uh, the, my, it's a pleasure, let's say, to present uh, the chair of uh, uh, NGN, Sigre uh, NGN Italy. Uh, so is uh, Mr. Marco Forteleoni. Forteleone, this is head of innovation factory transmission uh, Eterna, the transmission system operator in Italy. So, Marco, please. Yes, thank you, Andrea. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to open this uh, webinar, the first webinar that we have organized in our uh, uh, NGN uh, group in Italy. Uh, so, so, just a few words. I remember where. We constituted in the, in the, at the end of 2019, and then uh, we, in the, the last year, we faced uh, with the, the, uh, the, the, the start of the pandemic in Italy. And I remember that we were discussing how to boost uh, our uh, NGN group with all the other guys. So it was very challenging in 2020 uh, to try to organize our uh, activities in the new NGN group, but I think that. Uh, uh, despite the situation, we are uh, uh, we are trying to do our best to boost our uh, our group uh, in the NGN, and uh, it's a pleasure also to collaborate with uh, NGN UK, and I also thank you the central office for all the support, uh, and it's a pleasure also to introduce uh, this uh, topic on the, resi the, re the resilience of the grid, and uh, because uh, I think that uh, we we are uh, and we are resilient in our life due to the pandemic situation. So uh, speaking about uh, uh, topics that are uh, close to our uh, business and fields of res resilience of the grid, uh, I think it, it's uh, very interesting uh, to deal with this, uh, uh, with this topic. And uh, I like also to um, to thank you all the, uh, the guys that are attending this, uh, this conference. I, I, think I, I see that are 126. And without far ado, I think that uh, we can uh, start with the, with, the web, with the webinar. Enjoy. And uh, Andrea, I give uh, the word to you for, uh, for going on, Gurfather. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marco. Thank you for your intervention. I'm going very fast uh, to present uh, uh, NGN Italy, very, very fast, three slides, and then I leave the, the word to the chair of uh, NGN uh, uh, UK. So as uh, Marco mentioned, uh, we are uh, quite uh, young, let's <laughs> say. So 2019 as uh, uh, born year, and current membership is around uh, 60 um, persons. So we are a small group, but very strong. 60% from university, 40% from utilities. And the membership as uh, uh, all the NGN group is uh, early career professional under age 35 and the students uh, from academia. Uh, actually, we passed, uh, let's say, number of months and the, the, the number of uh, telecom by teleconferences for understanding uh, who improve and increase our uh, um, uh, group. Uh, here is the the, let's say the, the, the big six, <laughs> so the, our six members, our uh, uh, chair, Marco, then Luigi, that is uh, here also speaker today, Arman, Arianna, myself, and uh, Francesco. And uh, uh, so here, uh, uh, let's say a, a small uh, uh, timeline, uh, let's say uh, we, 
after the our uh, um, creation we arrived to make the ngn presentation showcase a presentation of our activities to some uh, um, university students and now we are here for the first webinar so now it's the time of our uh, our because in this case we are a big family our chair but for the uk branch so Ing Xue, he is an uh, assistant professor in electrical power networks at University of Birmingham, and his research focuses on uh, uh, HVDC and power system simulation technology. So I will leave now to, uh, um, to Ing the right to share the screen in yes, one please. moment. Yes, now the screen is yours, so as the floor. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. OK, uh, one second. Why it's. Um, OK, um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Andrea, for a very nice uh, introduction. And my name is Yin Xue. I'm currently the chair of Sigre uh, UK NGN. And I would like to give a very quick introduction of Sigre UK NGN and what we're doing and what we are going to do in the future. Um, for the NGN, basically, you can consider it as a gateway uh, to Sigre. It's a professional network for engineers and academia uh, researchers uh, to interact. Uh, currently at UK, we have a fairly strong uh, steering committee with uh, members from, as you can see, uh, different leading industry companies and also leading universities uh, in the UK. Uh, compared with the Italy NGN, we're actually quite old. Uh, we were set up in 2007. It is the Sigre's first young member group. And currently we have over 240 active membership uh, within the Sigre UK NGN. The main benefits of joining NGN is, first of all, it's free for the students and first two to three years young, uh, free for the young professionals. And also, once you join in, you have the uh, good opportunity to join international working groups so you can learn and interact with uh, experts in the same field. And remember, it's very important, especially for the young engineers, professionals and students, you do not have to be an expert uh, to join in, in the first place. And these are some of the previous events that we have held. Uh, for example, we have uh, held uh, power station visits, uh, HVDC demonstration, uh, demonstration, demonstrator visits, and also various other uh, substation and HVDC converter station visits. I'd like to highlight a few recent events that we have uh, organized uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, for, for example, this one, uh, Nelson substation visit. Uh, this one was, uh, was, uh, was in collaboration with the University of Strathclyde. Uh, that was under the uh, Network Innovation Competition Project, uh, Phoenix. And also we carry out also educational events. For example, this one uh, with East at East Cambridge uh, Careers and Skills event. Uh, for example, as you can see in the picture, for that particular event, uh, we welcomed over 1,500 primary and secondary students. And this is our last event, actually before the pandemic, is in 5th of February 2020, uh, where we have the Young Member Showcase, where the winners have got the uh, free tickets to the Paris session. And last year, since the pandemic, because we can't have the face-to-face -face meetings, uh, we carry out a range of online technical webinars, as you can see here, in collaboration with uh, Sigre Island NGN, uh, Sigre US National Committee, University of Birmingham, with Denmark and also Aust Austria. And now we are collaborating with Italy NGN. Uh, one of the, of course, the, the, the famous Paris session uh, was uh, one of the famous technical congress and exhibition uh, of Sigre. Um, if you join the SIGRE, you have the opportunity, for example, to win free, to free tickets uh, to join a session so that you can learn from the worldwide experts within the SIGRE community. If you'd like to know more about what we're doing in the future, you can follow us on the LinkedIn page, and we also have a Twitter, and you can also subscribe to our newsletter. And finally, uh, we have launched our 
uh, mentoring scheme where uh, young professionals or researchers will have the opportunity uh, to learn from more experienced or senior CGRE members, uh, both academically and also to, uh, for your career as well. Okay, so thank you very much. And that's all from me. Thank you, thank you very much, Ying, for this uh, presentation. Very exhaustive, also for in general uh, for uh, the people that uh, still, uh, uh, let's say, don't know about Sigre. They are new. They are uh, about uh, this uh, this world. So thanks a lot. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, immediately present uh, uh, both uh, uh, our speaker with uh, one slide. Then I leave the floor uh, to them in such a way that uh, I can switch off uh, my camera and uh, uh, they can uh, present uh, their speech. So the first speech uh, is Dr. Luigi Calcara. It is currently a member, as uh, I said before, of the SIGRE Italian GN and is an uh, assistant professor at uh, the University of Rome, La Sapienza, so the first uh, university of Rome and uh, he will provide uh, a speech entitled Heat Waves Effect on Media Voltage Electrical Network. The second uh, speaker is uh, Alex, Dr. Alejandro Martinez Cesena, and, uh, which is, who is an academic fellow in Multi-Energy System at the University of Manchester. Um, he will provide the speech entitled Technical Economical Modeling and Assessment of Forward Resilience Measures, so we see that the two topic, one is regarding the heat wave, the other, uh, let's say, on the modeling of the entire system. So uh, we will enjoy your speech. And now, Luigi, the floor is yours. And I will provide you the right to share your screen. Thank you, guys. OK, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, now yes. Okay, so thank you everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, today in the framework of the electrical resilience, that is the topic of our webinar, uh, I will introduce my main research topic that uh, concerns the heat waves effect on medium voltage electrical grid and uh, in particular, um, I would uh, um, start with the, the, the definition of resilience. That is uh, a word that in the last years, in the last uh, um, last years, last months, is very, very used use in the world. So um, then uh, I will show you also who is ARERA, that is the Italian uh, regulatory authority for energy networks and environment um, in front of versus the resilience definition and the resilience uh, behavior of the electrical grid. Then with the chapter two, we will go in depth in the main topic of uh, this uh, presentation that concerned the uh, investigation on medium voltage underground cables and in particular um, we started uh, with uh, um, monitoring of several uh, underground lines and um, with, uh, um, with uh, monitoring the systems then I will show you uh, the expansion on uh, medium voltage cables and in particular medium voltage joints that are the most critical part of uh, an underground line. Then I will show you a few slides concerns the modeling of these joints for study um, more in depth the uh, some defects and then uh, I will show you um, some mitigation actions for increase the resilience of the underground grid and at the end some suggestions um, concerning the development actions in the ex existing uh, grid. So as I say in this slide I show you the 
definition that of resilience that uh, for example comes from Arera that I repeat again is the Italian regulatory authority for energy networks and environment that defines the, the, the resilience uh, in this way resilience is the ability of a system to return quickly to the initial situation after suffering a disturbance and also the resistance to stress and the ability to restore the service even in emergency conditions are essential components of the resilience then we have also very a lot of uh, the definition a lot of definition of resilience and uh, each definition is characterized by um, some keywords like um, recovery like uh, fast uh, recovery like uh, um, the guarantee functionality and the ability to limit the the duration the degradation of the system after uh, an extreme event and um, summarizing all these uh, uh, keywords we uh, arrive to the identification of a set of key uh, actionable measures to be taken before, during, and after an extreme events, such as the anticipation, the preparation, the assumption, the sustain, sustainment of critical system operations, the rapid recovery, and the adapt, uh, adaption. All these uh, keywords are, um, have been defined in the framework of the working group of the SIGRE C4.47. Um, so, um, ARERA um, established in, in Italy in um, the beginning of uh, 2016 a regu regulatory um, plan um, in able to uh, define some um, rules for the distributors and the TSO. And in particular, uh, concerning the improvement of the network, concerning the introduction of new uh, incentive schemes, and the promotion of faster supply restoration. So uh, all these, um, uh, in consequence of these, the DSO and the TSO uh, have to publish and up update the resilience plan. Why we uh, started with the study of the effect of heat waves on electrical grid? Because we saw that uh, in the last years, uh, due to the increasing of the extreme uh, weather conditions, like heat waves, for example, we saw that um, an increasing trend of these failures of the underground um, line. And in particular, we can see from the, this first uh, figure, we, the first graph, as uh, starting from the two, 2012, we um, we assisted to the increasing of this failure rate in the underground line. And in particular, these faults involved the, uh, in the, involved the joints that are the most critical part of underground cable. And, and the minor part, the general insulation of the cable, only few, um, few parts of these failures. And, uh, and also, uh, we can see from this second picture that these failures uh, um, were uh, uh, um, are more evident in the during the summer period, and in particular from June to August. We can see, as for example, in July, we have uh, a failure rate that is four or also five times the failure rate that we have in the other uh, part of the year. So uh, we started this investigation 
And in particular, we uh, um, started this investigation in several underground lines. We installed, in particular, a medium voltage underground temperature monitoring with a data logger and with also other uh, probes. Then we, um, we studied the, um, the, the favorite and not favorite joints uh, that uh, um, install, installed in the, in the underground. And then um, we realized a model and we uh, suggested some mitigation actions and also uh, some improvements in the technological uh, aspects of the joints are uh, shown. So, uh, coming to the first point, uh, I say that we installed in the last uh, year. Um, now, um, there are, we, we installed this system three, three, four years ago. And uh, this system is composed by a data logger that collects all the information registered uh, from the probes that are installed on the cable. You can see this picture. Um, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse, or maybe I can use laser point. Okay. So we sold uh, this probe on the cable surface, also on the joint. We sold also the another um, probe of temperature at the same level of the cable, of the underground cable, and on the surface of the soil. And we equipped also our system with uh, two other additional probes of humidity and also a, a probe for measure, for measure the current that flow through this cable. So we can see uh, comparing uh, the winter period, the results that uh, come from the winter period with the other from the summer period, we can see that in the black um, in the black uh, line, the temperature of the surface of the cable that is more or less similar to the trend of the um, of the temperature of the joint, and uh, with the blue line we have the uh, ambient temperature. We can see that comparing the winter period with the summer period, we have a, an increasing temperature on the surface of the cable of more or less 18 degrees centigrade. So in, it is not a critical um, temperature because the maximum temperature that uh, reached this cable was 35 or 40, um, 40 degrees centigrade. So, but uh, we assist to the summer period um, in the summer period to these uh, failures. So we uh, passed it to another, uh, another uh, action. We uh, studied the favorite and not favorite joints inspection. And in particular, we saw that uh, sometimes these joints um, are not uh, um, are are uh, manufactured maybe not uh, uh, in perfect mode not uh, um, um, using all the uh, components that are available in the uh, packaging and in particular for example in the Laptop left side, we can see an opened, unopened joint uh, subjected to a failure. And uh, we can see that this failure started from the point of contact between the cable uh, metallic shield and the joint metallic shield. In, the, in this case, we have the um, uh, not correct 
uh, use of, of the components provided by the manufacturer and in particular here I, um, it was used uh, um, uh, a wire made in uh, maybe in an iron wire uh, and here it was used only one uh, component instead of two for uh, ensure the contact between the, sh the metallic shield of the joint with the, um, the external metallic shield of the cable. And in other case, we saw also uh, this effect, uh, these string signs in the interfacial region between two different insulating materials. And in particular, the string, string effects um, um, are very, very important for the, um, for the failure of the cable that we show you in the next slide. So taking into account of this, we uh, studied a uh, representation of all components of um, the, uh, the joints and in particular of the self uh, shrinking joints that are the most used in the last years and are the most affected of these failures. So uh, you can see from this slide how is very complicated the structure of a joint. In particular you can see that uh, there is uh, an overlapping of different layers of materials or different layers of components. So um, for, um, for the manufacturer is not, uh, um, for the operators, is not uh, simple to um, install in very hard conditions like, for example, during the summer period uh, or in, in it's not uh, simple to, um, to um, realize this joint in a critical situation. So, uh, and also uh, this uh, um, representation, this uh, uh, joint uh, structure is different from manufacturer to manufacturer. So, um, the presence of uh, some imperfections during the, um, the packaging of the uh, joint uh, is very, uh, very common. So, uh, in fact, uh, it is possible that in the interfacial region between the, these different overlapping of insulating materials, uh, can be present uh, some uh, imperfection introduced, for example, during the packaging on site. And uh, um, we can study, we studied the, um, for example, the electrical field in, in during the, along the, the insulating material. Uh, we can say that the geometrical electrical field in typical insulating material of medium voltage is in the order of few kilovolt per millimeter. The situation obviously changes when some defects are present or are formed inside the insulation. For example, in this case, we considered a void or an imperfection between two, within this interfacial region. And in presence of these defects, uh, we can go in the situation of the uh, partial discharges inception. And uh, in this uh, case, discharge migration due to the partial discharge activity inside this cavity uh, is then could be and the origin of part degradation process of the insulating material, and it may lead to the electrical string enhancements, as we saw in the last picture that is also here reported, for example. So um, we can see that along the, uh, the, 
um, the tightness of the insulating material, we can see that the electric field is normal, 2 kilovolt per millimeter, but increase when we uh, are in presence of void, for example. And this value is critical because it could be also greater than the electric strength of the air. And uh, could uh, and this uh, this uh, um, can be at the origin of the path discharge and also the of the final failure, for example. Um, so this light, I can show you some. Uh, it's possible to express uh, some medium voltage joints mitigation actions. For example, the coordination of the uh, protection systems, because we have to know that the uh, electrical grid is uh, already installed in the urban area, for example. We cannot imagine to change all the underground cables that are installed in the city, in the urban area. So we have to try to use some mitigation action for the already existing cables, existing grid. Like, for example, um, could be planned an extensive application of the coordination, of the amperometric coordination for the selection of multi-phase faults to ground, reducing the total light, the total time of circulation of short circuit currents. Then, uh, for example, a better implementation of the criteria for fault location on the ground medium voltage network, reducing also in this case the number of automatic circuit breaker recrossings. Then sometimes, sometimes it was also applied the solution, the reduction of the voltage stress on the electrical components, uh, reducing also the, in some particular portion of the grid, reducing the voltage of the medium voltage line, or also the creation of new transversal lines, improving the meshing of the medium voltage distribution network and integrated with remote control technology. And the last point is uh, very, very important because uh, we are working on this direction to review the component technologies and assembly pro procedures, standardizing a new generation of simplified cable joints, which should be better resilient to the additional thermal and electrical stresses due to original imperfection and progressive degradation phenomena at very, very minuscule interface level. And we can arrive to the general conclusion that we also said. We can summarize in these five points, for example, like the, as we said during the summer periods of the last years, the number of medium voltage underground cables joints failures greatly increased. These failures may be consequence of thermal degradation of the insulating material, and in particular in the interface with the external metallic shield of joints. Then the, in this defect, parts of discharge activity may, be, may take place. Uh, and in presence of a defect, the electric field uh, changed direction, because in this case is, is in the direction um, of the uh, interfascial uh, region and at the present time uh, we are working to study a new joint 2.0 smart joint thank you for your kind attention thank you thank you luigi uh, some question already arrived but uh, we will move forward to the next uh, uh, speaker then we can make a sort of round table starting from the, the question arriving from uh, the audience and then maybe adding uh, uh, some more uh, uh, hints for the discussion. So, okay, thanks again. I will leave immediately the floor to uh, Alex. Okay, yes, I think Alex, you can share your screen, right? Yes. Uh, the good, question good, is so the floor is yours. So, can you see my presentation now? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Okay, perfect. So my, my name is uh, Eduardo Alejandro Martinez Eseña. Most people just call me Alex, um, an academic fellow at the University of Manchester. I'm going to be presenting some of the work that uh, I do as, as well as some work that was initiated by some of my colleagues, especially uh, Dr. Mateo Spantelli and Pierluigi Mancarella on, on this topic. Uh, so we have been working on this for about uh, 10 years or, or so. Um, what I'm going to try to do here is uh, basically uh, cover some of the basics of what resilience means and some of the type of, of analysis that, uh, that, we, that we do in, in the team. I'm going to try to go a bit quicker than anticipated, just to give us a bit of time to, to have a discussion at, at the end. So why, why do we need uh, resilience? What, 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 what's happening? So the, the main driver is the increased uncertainty. Uh, the, the, the conditions of the system. So what is happening to our system? Well, we know that we have uh, environmental targets, which means that now we are a bit more interested in having more renewables. So we're replacing our fossil fuel generation with renewables. At the same time, we have more flexibility, more smart devices, smart grids, smart appliances, which are providing more flexibility to the system. So things are changing in our system. Also, because we have all these new devices, all these new technologies, we're starting to create coupling between different sectors, between different vectors. So now we have electric heating, we have electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles. So that starts creating coupling between these systems. That means that what happens to one system can now affect or have cascading effects on the other systems. So that can have that means that shocks or impacts or the non-resilience of a system can affect the others also just to make things a bit more interesting climate change is not only causing us to have a change in the way we operate the system and the loads that we have connected we also have harsher and more frequent extreme events so now we hear more often that there was a heat wave a storm these effects there are changing a network so everything is changing at the same time so what does that mean for let's say an investment an investor uh, or someone who's developing the grid or the power system where traditionally the demand growth this is looking let's say across different years was relatively stable so we could use approaches that we're very close to deterministic. We had some uncertainty about what was happening in the future, but not that much. We started having these variations, this flexibility, and the future started becoming a bit more probabilistic. So we're, we're not so sure about how it looks like. And now we even have new technologies. We don't know if the future is going to be electrified, hydrogen, a new technology. So our future start becoming a bit more difficult to forecast. If we look at it from a mathematical perspective, that means that before we had kind of a central view. We thought like, okay, this is more or less how the future looks like. And there is some uncertainty, some standard deviation around it. But now we are not entirely sure how the future looks like so we we no longer have like a proper shape so this becomes a bit asymmetrical and there is a chance that things are going to go drastically different than forecasted or that the system would have to deal with harsher conditions that we normally consider for for our systems so that that means a fatter tail so a bit focused on, on, on the mathematics or more or less how this looks like. So these are not exactly the shapes that we will be seeing in practice, but what we know is that it's going to be asymmetrical. So it's not going to have the same shape on both sides, like a normal distribution, and it's going to have a fat tail. Okay, so what does that mean? How, how does that translate to resilience? And how do we quantify those, those effects? So firstly, okay, traditionally, we focus on the mean, expected energy not supplied, uh, or other expected values. And we normally focus on expected because in terms of economics, it makes sense. 
if we know, for example, how much we expect in terms of these connections, and we have an estimate of how much we spend if we don't supply the load, let's say the expected value or the average value is, let's say 10, 10 billion per, per year. So we know that the most that we should be spending in this would be those 10 billion. If we are able to invest less than that, then uh, it's a good investment, it's cheaper, we, we get savings. But the moment the shape changes, then firstly, our mean is no longer in line with what happens most of the time. So our approximation is not that great. Secondly, we are grossly overestimating or underestimating what happens in these extreme cases. So before it was like, okay, we would lose a bit of money. So worst case scenario, we, we lose some money some years, but in other years we, re we recover it. But how, is, how are extreme events different? Well, these extreme events are different because the effects, the, the damage that those extreme events can cause can be deadly, can be significantly harsher than what we normally consider. So this is a, an illustration for a book that we find quite interesting because this is about a river. In average, the depth of the river is quite low. So someone can walk on that river without any issues. But, as, but because we don't consider the extremes, the, the worst cases, which in this case can be as deep as for a person to drown, we are overlooking the, these extreme effects. And in this case, it's not that the person is going to get wet if it's slightly deeper than anticipated, is that in this case, this person can drown, this person can die. In, in the case of our system, we have seen the, the effects in other countries that these extreme events can cause massive damage and can cause uh, strong effects on the life of people. So what that means is that we can no longer just focus on the mean values. We need something else. We need other metrics, for example, conditional values. We need something that can focus on the tail, on those extreme characteristics. What does that mean? When we're talking about reliability or probabilistic studies, we're focusing on expected values, on probabilities. When we go into resilience, we focus on the impact of the event. It's not so much the probability itself, it's how hard can it hit us and our system. Is this enough? So we address this mathematically speaking. We just got some curves, we got some calculations. Is that enough to represent the impacts of resilience? Not really, because the impacts of resilience go beyond the mathematics, go beyond the, the engineering perspective. If you have a, an event in the system, let's say an interruption, a typical reliability-based event, you get people upset. Well, I lost my connection. I couldn't watch my series. I had to go somewhere else. You, you got them bothered. But if it's an extreme event, then something harsh just happened. We just had a hurricane. We just had an earthquake. And people who get disconnected under those conditions, they go into panic. They get scared. So the longer you take to reconnect them, the longer you take to resupply the service, these people can start acting irrationally. They can go into panic. They can cause additional damage to themselves, to, uh, to the system. So the reaction of the system, the reaction of the people, the impact is fundamentally different when you're in an extreme shock. So Overall, what does this mean? And we're going now into the, some of the definitions like what Luigi was mentioning. That means that whereas in reliability, we're mostly focused on, on the expected value or, or the expected uh, happening of an event. In terms of resilience, we need to see not only the event, but how it evolves. So if we look into the definitions, we're not only focused on what happened with the event, we're focusing on what happened before what happened during and what happened after 
the event. So the definitions change depending on who you talk to, but the overall idea is that it's not enough to just check the event. You need to check the impact and how that evolves. That also means that the measures, the solutions that you propose for addressing these events also have to uh, address these different stages of the event from before to after. And the metrics, these, there are many new metrics that are being proposed, like the uh, resilience triangle or trapezoid, or this one, this is one that was proposed by, by my colleagues, Professor Mancarella and, and Dr. Pantelli, which is the, the FLEP metric, which is a way of quantifying what's happening throughout the lifetime of the event. So now going a bit into the to the examples, so I'm going to go slightly quickly, just focusing on, on the core ideas. So, well, we need to focus, as we mentioned, on the event. So in terms of resilience, we're focusing on the extreme shock. So what we're going to be doing here, this is an example of the UK, we assume that the event is happening. So we are moving on straight to, to the tail. So it's no longer the likelihood of an event happening. Now it's, okay, what happens if the event actually happens? Now, once you, you've established that the event actually happens, you focus on modeling, well, if the event happens, where, can it, where would it go? What type of impact could it have on the system? In this case, we stochastically model the different paths of the event, in this case, throughout the UK, and how it can break different parts of the network based on, in this case, what it's called the fragility curve. The fragility curve is, some, is a study, that in this case, made by civil engineers on how specific events, in this case, windstorms, can break your system. So now we're focusing on the tail, we're focusing on the event happening, we're modeling its path, we're checking what's happening before, during, and after the event, and we're trying to understand how that breaks the system. How is this useful? Well, it's useful because you can try to identify which type of events, how severe your events have to be to break your system, what do you need to be careful uh, about. Once you know which conditions can hurt your system, what do you do? What can you do to make your system resilient to those type of events? Do you make your assets stronger? Okay, if the issue is that my assets can break, perhaps I can strengthen these assets. I can make them hard, harder to break, although that would be a bit expensive. Is making the assets the only option? Not really. You can also think about, well, if, if, uh, if the event can break parts of my systems, what about diversifying my technologies? So rather than putting all my eggs in one basket, one basket that can be destroyed by an extreme event, what happens if I start placing my assets in different locations, if I use assets that are re more resilient to different type of events? Is that it? No, you can also think about flexibility. The issue of these extreme events is that they don't happen very often, so it's difficult to justify investing in these solutions. But what about if we use the existing resources, let's say the flexibility that is available in the grid, but we use it to make the system more resilient. If we know that a storm is coming, why can't we start uh, storing some of our energy in distributed batteries and things like that? And what this type of study is showing uh, this is again another study performed by some of my colleagues, is that when you are in extreme events, there is a cross between these two lines. This cross means that there is a point where flexibility is as effective as strengthening the assets. Overall, what these different studies are telling you is that when you're addressing resilience, you need to focus on the impacts. 
it's not enough just to focus on the event itself, but you need to check the whole transition before, during, and after. And you can have a portfolio of future me measures, different options, to be able to make your system resilient to those type of, of events. And also, I also have here some, some relevant projects in case you're, you're interested in getting a bit more information about this type of analysis. And I think I'm, I'm going to leave the, the discussion there. I think we have a, some time for, for some questions. So sorry, Andre, if I took a bit longer than anticipated. Don't worry, don't worry. It was a pleasure to hear about uh, your studies and your uh, uh, results. So I think, I think that the, the audience is very active, so uh, this is uh, quite good. Uh, so um, I, I tried, let's say, to... Uh, I, I think that now we can um, open, uh, let's say, the, the, the part regarding uh, uh, the discussion together. So if, if uh, also Luigi would like to, to switch on his camera, uh, there are some questions arriving, so I can try to summarize a little bit, uh, um, uh, let's say, some of them. Uh, for example, uh, let's say, uh, one is, uh, uh, what do you think, uh, let's say, uh, for the event probability and the severity of the events in the future, especially the energy transition. How, let's say, how is expected to imp increase or, or not increase this kind of event uh, in the future? I think uh, it's open for both of you, for Alex, for one, uh, some of the threats that uh, they face, but also to Luigi regarding the heat wave. So guys, what do you think about this? In my case, maybe, uh, as we can assist in the last uh, years, uh, these events are increasing. So we have to, to be able to try to realize and to, uh, um, to allow to, to the grid to be more resilient. So this is why we are here today. Yeah, I, I, I agree. The, the events are becoming harsher and more frequent. Unfortunately, yeah. or fortunately, not frequent enough to be captured under normal conditions. So the probability is still very low for us to basically capture the, the economic value with traditional means. So we do need, uh, we, we need more resilient grids and we do need better ways to, to quantify and justify investments in, in resilience measures. So regarding this, I didn't mind the one question, then maybe also the other uh, um, we can get from uh, also from the audience, but uh, link to this. So if uh, the, uh, let's say, the um, uh, probability of, of uh, uh, the expected probability of the event are increasing, so we are going uh, from a new reliability, I mean, uh, these uh, conditions that are now are uh, HIMP, high impact, low probability events, are becoming more and more frequently, so we have to change and to uh, increase the uh, uh, investment in the new reliability that uh, will, will include the res what it now is called the resilience, because if the, 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 the probability of uh, uh, occurrence is increasing in the future, uh, the, the difference between re resilience and reliability will become lower and lower. So what do you think about this? Yeah, well, th th that is correct. In If the probability increases, then, well, increases enough, then it, it, it will converge towards reliability. Although for that to happen, that, that means that we're, we're actually expecting these events to happening uh, several times a year. So for for that to happen, we would be in really big trouble. Okay. I, I agree. <laughs> this is a good point, but it was, let's say, a, a more uh, uh, provocative than this. I think there is um, uh, uh, there is a, a question for, I think, more for Luigi. Uh, is does the high fault currents and longer short uh, uh, short circuit events increase the rate of underground uh, cable joints? I think not the rate, but let's say the 
in, decrease the, 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 for the for life. Sure. For, for sure, yes, but uh, uh, depends from the the system depends from the protection and uh, in general also from the, uh, the the type of joints that we have stored depends okay one question for alex uh, first of all there is an interesting presentation this is fine so it's always good to to listen about this um, in the last bit uh, where flexibility was considered effective what type of scenario was this tested on? And how is flexibility defined, strictly speaking? So which is the, the, the definition of flexibility you used? So in, in this case, the, the scenarios that were tested was how harsh the events were. So we began with, okay, traditional reliability, having one or two disconnections to the other extreme, which is when you have an event that can break parts of, of your system. And, and this flexibility was mostly in the form of, of storage or distributed generation that was located throughout the network. So it becomes, uh, what, what starts happening is if there is something able to break your system, but you still have uh, spatial or some resources throughout the system that can resupply some parts of it, you can minimize the impact. Okay, thanks. Uh... I think that we can make one more question so that there could be open also as a discussion, the final. Uh, then I will forward uh, to you the other uh, question that I'm collecting, but uh, only for uh, for uh, closing this this session is uh, your opinion, some, some hints regarding who should this, which is the level of resilience for which the customer is willing to pay for, first of all. So how to define this? And who should define this? So what, what do you think about this? Because at the end, some investment should be remunerated no? for uh, in some way, let's say cost-benefit analysis, uh, out, uh, output-based regulation, something. But at the end, some money have to take it from someone and provide it to someone else. So, uh, and this amount of money change according to the, the, the level of resilience that is decided to be okay. So, uh, which is this level, in your opinion? How to define these? Uh, and, and also, so this level is increasing uh, year by year. So, yeah. for example, in Italy, we have Arera that is working on this direction. And uh, um, every year, or couple of years, uh, they ask it. They ask to to the uh, DSO, for example, or the DTSO to reduce the, the out of service time. Uh, so um, it, it is working on this direction, um, the reduction of the time of out of service, uh, both for medium voltage, also for low voltage and high voltage. Yeah. So we have to pay for, for this. Yeah, Re regarding the, the the exact cost is still quite uncertain because as we are not we're currently not fully addressing resilience, it's something that that, that that we don't cater for right now. The few measures that we do deploy are extremely expensive because they're, they're not widespread. So if we based it on on current investments, we, we're grossly overestimating it. Th that should decrease as we. Uh, implement or combine uh, extend re reliability with resilience regarding who should be responsible that is a very difficult question uh, as this is something like insurance because ultimately you are you are paying to make sure that in the worst case scenario you're going to be fine it makes a bit more sense for for governments to take uh, initiative uh, at least at the beginning uh, but that this is going to change based on people's perspectives, based on different countries. Uh, so it, it is it is very difficult to to tell. But I, I would vote for the government for the time being. Yes, yes. Yes, I, I think that uh, in any case, this uh, let's say this question will uh, will get more uh, um, let's say uh, could could be answered only in a, as as you mentioned in probabilistic way. 
So for sure, the deterministic, uh, the deterministic uh, value well defined uh, could not be uh, the proper answer, and so uh, will be interesting uh, uh, to the, the modeling of this uncertainty, and also the, the, the tool uh, for modeling this uncertainty and for providing the correct balance between uh, what is paid and uh, what is the, the damage that we are avoiding. So step by step, uh, we will arrive to understand better. Uh, which is the, the correct balance uh, about about this. So, guys, uh, thank you very much. We are quite uh, in uh, in time, so this is very good. <laughs> it's only two two minutes, uh, uh, let's say, in delay. Uh, there is still uh, some question that uh, let's say we will. Uh, uh, I will forward uh, to you. So now we can, I think, uh, uh, I can uh, thank all uh, the, the, the participants, first of all, that uh, join uh, our first uh, of the long series webinar, joint webinar between uh, NGN UK and Italy. So thank you, Alex. Thank you, uh, Luigi, Ying, and Marco for uh, being here and uh, uh, providing uh, the, the presentation, your part. Uh, so. Uh, I hope to see you soon, hopefully in person, but at least in video. And uh, let's say, see you the next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.